Right, if you've got a copy of God's Word, you can go to Revelation chapter 5. We're going to read the entire chapter. We're going to be able to cover the entire chapter tonight. We're going to do part one. The worthy Lamb and the scroll with seven seals. Revelation chapter 5. You got your place? Uh, if you were missing the notes this morning, that's my fault. I posted them on Facebook a little while ago for you. And I've also posted tonight's notes. They are just notes. They're not Bible app notes this week. Um, they are just on the Facebook page there. So if you want to follow along with me, uh, it's my manuscript of tonight's sermon. Revelation chapter 5, reading from God's Word, it says, And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside, Sealed with seven seals, and I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion... Of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing." Every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, I love you and I praise you, dear Lord. And God, I agree tonight. Worthy are you of praise tonight. God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you've done. God, we thank you for your son. Lord, we, thank, we are thankful tonight that there is a worthy lamb that has ascended to heaven and is there with you. Lord, and that he is a soon coming king. And Lord, we give him all praise, honor, and glory tonight for what he has done for the sacrifice that He made, for the blood that He has shed. And God, we pray tonight, Father, from the Word that You would speak to our hearts. And God, that we would go away from here, Lord, uh, more appreciative of what He's done. Lord, that we would go away from here, Lord, with an urgency to share His gospel message. And Lord, we just, we just come before You tonight. God, just asking You to move in our midst. And Father, if there's somebody here tonight that doesn't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, I pray, God, before they leave this place tonight, Lord, that they would know Him. Lord, that even right now, God, before we even preach the first word, God, that the power of Your Holy Spirit might prick them in their heart, God, and they might be convicted of their sin. And Lord, know Jesus Christ before it's too late. Lord, we love You in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. And as we continue our study on the book of Revelation, we find ourselves still in the throne room of God. You remember from last week we were looking at this heavenly scene of worship. We were seeing these angelic beings around the host, uh, around the throne of God, this angelic host.
hosts around the throne of God when we're seeing the 24 elders representative of the church around the throne. We saw God Almighty seated uh, in the place of power on the throne. And so we're continuing with that same point. And, and David Jeremiah really brings this out. If you go and read uh, his, his uh, book on this, you'll find that he really hammers home the point that this is a continuation. What we see in chapter 5 is just a continuation of what transpired in chapter 4. Now chapter 4 and chapter 5 are set in heaven. Chapter 6 through 19 with at least one break are set primarily uh, in things happening on the earth. They may open the seals at certain places and things like that, but they're poured out the judgments that come over the course of the next few chapters or the the majority of the chapters of Revelation will occur on the earth. But you've got to remember, these chapter divisions have been inserted to help bring clarity to the writing for us. But for the people who received this letter, the seven churches that this letter originally went to, they were receiving the letter of Revelation, not with division. They were reading this as one thing. And so they would have been reading this as one long letter. They would have moved right out of that heavenly seat of worship. And they would have saw what John saw as they read it. And that would have been that their, that God, their God is holding a scroll with seven seals. And, and in his hand, that no one is able to go and to remove that from his hand. No one is able to open that. And so John becomes uh, very sorrowful in spirit. Because obviously, if God is going to show him the things that are to be hereafter, someone's got to open that scroll. Yeah. And so he's sorrowful in heart because there's not one found to open it. But we're going to find out tonight that there's a worthy lamb that can open the scroll with the seven seals. Amen? Amen? And so the worship of God is given way to this vision of the scroll in God's hand. And so let me just tell you, this is what we're going to begin to see in the book of Revelation as these seals will be unraveled over the next several chapters. Do you remember a question that the disciples asked of Jesus one time? It's found in Matthew 24 and verse number 3. It says, as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? It's known as the Olivet Discourse. And Jesus begins to unravel some things that will transpire at the end of time. And a lot of it will marry up to things that we see as we go throughout the book of Revelation. But let me tell you something. That is what is wrapped up right there. In, in, in that same line of thinking, we're about to see after this chapter, we're going to see the process by which God pours out His judgment on the world and He places all the kingdoms of the world in the hands of Jesus Christ. And so we, we'll see that there will be uh, seven seals that will be opened. And when we get to the seventh seal, there will be seven trumpets that transpire from there. And when we get to this seventh trumpet where Jesus Christ is declared to be uh, all the kingdoms of the world have been returned to the Lord and His Christ. When we get to that seventh trumpet, then seven bowls of final judgment will come out. Revelation 11, 15, then the seventh angel sounded. And there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of His Christ, and He will reign forever and ever. Listen, that is what this is all about. This is God's finality to bring forth His Son, not as Savior this time, but as King of kings, Lord of lords, ruler and reigner for all eternity. Amen. Make no mistake about it, folks. The unraveling of revelation is to bring judgment upon the unbelieving, to, to, uh, to, to bring a finality to all the kingdoms of the world as they are today and to place them, invest them in, in the, the reign of Jesus Christ. That is the program God is running. His Son ruling and reigning forever and ever. So that introduces us to this scene in chapter 5 where we have a scroll in the hand of God that cannot be opened. And I want you to notice, notice where they search. Listen, they don't just search over heaven for someone to open this scroll. Look where it says that they search 
for uh, it says that no man, this is verse number three, no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look down. No man, no man was worthy to take that scroll from the hand of God. No man was worthy to open the seals. But there was one who is worthy. We'll see him here in a moment. What is this scroll? What is this scroll? Well, I personally believe that this scroll, and, and, and I've told you this as we kind of went along in this study on Revelation, that uh, there are times that you have to understand the book of Daniel to understand Revelation. There's times you have to understand the book of Ezekiel to understand Revelation. Because there's things that were revealed to them that while they were far off and didn't make a lot of sense to folks as they said them at that time, they make perfect sense when you read them in light of what's taking place in the book of Revelation. Matter of fact, let's just think about Daniel for a moment because I, I personally believe that the scroll of the Revelation is the scroll that Daniel is told in Daniel 12 and verse number 4. He said, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end, and many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Listen. Uh, Daniel had a lot of things to say. We have the benefit of the, of the full counsel of God. We have the benefit of being able to read the book of Daniel and what he was being told. But listen, those things were to be shut up for a space of time because to be quite honest with you, folks just wouldn't have understood if they didn't know the things that we know now in the book of Revelation. David Jeremiah says, he says that the book of Daniel will be the most read book during the tribulation period because folks will want to know what in the world is going on. What in the world has happened on this earth? Why is there such chaos on this earth? Why are such things taking place? And someone will finally say to them, friend, have you never read the Bible? Friend, have you never looked into the book of Daniel? Have you never read what he wrote to transpire in those last days? And folks, they'll be aware of what is happening all around them. But for many of them, it will be too late. It will be too late. The enemy will have blinded their eyes and their minds so that they will not believe. God will have sent them strong delusion that they would believe a lie. Folks, that is where we are because John is dealing with the end of the age and Daniel was told to shut this book up even to the time of the end. We're dealing with the end of the age and he's seeing the things which must be hereafter. I just be quite honest with the book, uh, that book of Daniel and, and the, the book that he's told to bind up and seal for the time of the end, it, quite frankly, it's a mystery until the writing of the Revelation. Someone may say, well, Brother Jeff, I, I, I thought you said that the Bible's not a mystery novel. And it isn't, but I want you to know something. According to the Bible, there are things that God did not initially reveal that he did not, that he did not give all the all the things uh, as far as I uh, think about this, the, the coming of Christ. The prophets could see it that there was going to be a deliverer, but they couldn't see the lamb being slain. They thought they were getting a ruler. Hello? It, it was a mystery about what God was going to do through that. And then Jesus Christ comes and he takes the cover off. Hey, I'm the fulfillment of the law. I'm the righteous one. I'm the holy one. I'm the one without spot or blemish that'll be sacrificed. For your sin. Amen. Amen. Mm. Then he's coming back as that, as that ruler and that reigner that they were looking for. And so it's not a mystery novel, but God did not initially reveal. He reveals it as he chooses to reveal it, and it's no longer a mystery. The writing of Daniel would have been meaningless to people at the time because the fulfillment of them, the fulfillment of the things in the book of Daniel were so far away. Yet in the days from the writing of Revelation. Till now, many of the things in Daniel now have a context, a framework in which to interpret them. And so I'll tell you that the book of Revelation gives us insight into why the scroll could not be opened by anyone other than Jesus Christ. Amen. This scroll could be opened alone by the worthy Lamb. Why do you say that, Brother Jeff? Well, look at what the, the people said. We'll get to talk more about this. Next week, Lord willing, verses 9 and 10 of Revelation chapter 5. He said they sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy 
to take the book. Now they're, they're singing a song to the Lamb of God. Did you know that? Right. When you come in here to worship, listen to me, church. I'll come back to that in just a second. When you come in here, you're not singing for your own benefit. You're not singing to make the pastor's heart happy. You're supposed to understand that your worship is toward one alone. He is worthy of all praise, honor, and glory. Thou alone art worthy, O oh Lord. Amen. He alone is worthy. If, you, if your worship is about anything else other than focusing your attention toward Jesus Christ, then something is amiss. Thou art worthy to take the book, to open the seals thereof. Listen to what it says. Why is he worthy to take and open the seals? For thou was slain, and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood, out of every kindred, and tongue, and people, and nation. And hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. It is because of the precious blood of Jesus that he is worthy to open the book. Because what he did was what man could not do. No one, no one had been able to restore God to man. No one could live righteously enough. No one could do right enough. No one could sacrifice enough. Yet Jesus Christ comes on the scene. And listen, my friend, he lays down his life for the world. He was, sl he was slain upon a cross so that the world could be reconciled to God. And so that the door of grace could be opened to whosoever will may come. Amen. Whosoever will may take, he tells us in the end of the book of Revelation, of the water of life freely. <clears throat> Y'all just sit there. I'm going to enjoy this. Amen. Jesus Christ redeemed mankind. Mankind separated you to sin. In Daniel's day, listen, the daily sacrifices were being carried out to make atonement for sin. Redemption was incomplete. And so this made the words of the book irrelevant to the time of Daniel. But we who are on the other side of Calvary have the full and complete forgiveness of God through Jesus Christ. And so God in righteous judgment will carry out His plan. Listen, listen, this is going to sound awful, but listen, I want you to understand you've got to take all of God. You can't just have the lovely part of God. You can't just have the blessing part of God. Listen, you've got to understand that God will visit His wrath upon those who refuse to believe. That God will visit His wrath upon those who worship other idols and other gods. If there's any God before Him, He will visit His wrath. Amen. He will carry out His plan to destroy all those who have failed to come under the provision. Did you hear that? The provision of Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus is worthy. Because He's made provision for mankind to be drawn back to God. To be in a right relationship with God. We've been redeemed. Listen, did you see who's been redeemed? It's out of every kindred, tongue, people, and nation. I don't care what your skin color is. I don't care what country you're from. I don't care what your background was before you came to Christ. In Christ there is no other identity other than a child of God. Yeah. Mm. The gospel of peace knows no barriers. He alone has redeemed mankind. He came in peace as Savior the first time. The Bible tells us that He's coming in judgment. So this portion of Revelation we're looking at tonight identifies Christ in, in three major ways. Number one, look back at verse number five. It'll catch two of them. Verse number five, what did he say? And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not. Behold the line of the tribe of Judah. The line of the tribe of Judah. So where does that come from, Brother Jeff? I, I've heard people sing that. I've heard people talk about that. Where's the line of the tribe of Judah for Jesus to be described that way? Where does that come from? Genesis chapter 49, verses 8 and 10. The Bible says, Judah, your brothers shall praise you. Your hands shall be on the neck of your enemies. Sounds like a strong person, doesn't it? Your father's son shall bow down to you. Everybody's going to worship Judah. The line of Judah. Judah's a lion's well. From the prey, my son, you've gone up. He couches. He lies down as a lion. 
And as a lion who dares rouse him up, the scepter, that is the kingdom, shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until Shiloh comes, peaceful one. And to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. Israel's deliverer was destined to come through the line of Judah. So the line of Judah comes from the line of Judah. So Jesus being a descendant of David, guess who David was a descendant of? Or a member of? He was a member of the tribe of Judah. That's why Saul, Saul wasn't from the right family, folks. He wasn't just because he was wicked. But the, the, the kingdom had to pass to the tribe of Judah because the deliverer, the lion of Judah, was going to come from the tribe of Judah. Yeah. So Judah's recognized as the lion that Israel prophesied of it, the blessing of his son. See, in the old days, before a person was going to die most of the time, and they blessed them at other times, but especially at their death, they would call their sons together, and they would speak a blessing over their life. Now, sometimes it didn't work out that way. Sometimes their kids had lived so wickedly, they spoke a curse over their life. But in Israel's case, listen, when, he, when he's talking about them, he's talking about blessing his sons, and he's saying, there's something good coming from your family, Judah. Right. Oh, it is the greatest thing that will cross the horizon of the earth. It will be the one who will deliver my people. There's a second thing that he's called in, in Revelation chapter 5. In verse number 5, it says, Not only the line of the tribe of Judah, but the root of David had prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. He is the root of David. And so what does that mean, Brother Jim? Means it's from David's family? Well, not exactly. It refers to the fact that David originated from Jesus. You say, how can that be? Because David lived before Jesus. Well, I got news for you. We're dealing with the Alpha and the Omega. We're dealing with the same Jesus that said, before Abraham was, I am. Man, right. He has always been. You go into eternity past, and my Jesus will meet you there. You go into eternity future, my Jesus will meet you there. I want you to understand that this evening. So he was not only was he David's ancestor, he was also David's descendant. Boy, that confused the, the deadlocks out of the Pharisees. Yeah. Jesus wanted to know, who, who, who Messiah? Whose son will he be? Well, David's son. Jesus looks at him and says, well, how did he say to the Lord, sit thou down, my Lord? How did he call him Lord if he's his descendant? Because David knew when he was writing Psalms, he knew that the Messiah that would come had always been and always would be. Yeah. And by the Spirit of God, he called him Lord. He called him Lord. Jesus is seen in the, in the Bible, uh, in, in, in the New Testament in particular. He's referred to as the Son of David 14 different times. Jesus refers to himself in the book of Revelation. When you get toward the end of the book, he refers to himself as the root and the offspring of David. So Jesus is both the originator of David and by birth is the descendant of David. He was before. And he was also out of the lineage of, lineage of David. And that makes him the promised one of Israel. And only the promised one of Israel is worthy to open the book. Number three, though, in verse number six. Look what it says about him. There's four things I'm going to show you about him from verse number 6. He said, I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. Folks, he is the lamb who was slain. But did you notice where this lamb was? This lamb was standing in the midst of the throne. He was standing before God Almighty. Who's worthy to stand before God Almighty? I'm not worthy to stand before God Almighty. Only because of Jesus. But you know what? Think about it for a minute. A lamb that's been slain don't stand, does it? No. No. It's lying down. But this lamb is standing. 
This lamb is standing. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says about Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians 15, verses 55 through 57, he says, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The lad that was slain is standing before the throne because he has been victorious over death. He has prevented, he presented his blood as a sacrifice to make an atonement for our sins in the throne room of God. And now he stands there waiting to open the book and the seals that have that book shut up. Are you with me? Amen. The scroll, that scroll is going to be open. It's going to be opened by the Lamb who was slain, who is standing victorious over death. Over death he has conquered. He has overcome death and he is victorious and he is pictured. Listen, not only is he, is he pictured here standing, understand that he is pictured here with bearing the marks of his death. It says that you can tell that this lamb has been slain. Yeah. <laughs> I believe, and you can believe differently if you want to, but I believe he will bear the marks throughout eternity. I believe that those marks will be there as a reminder of why we're there. I believe that there will be a point of celebration. I believe that every time that we look at Jesus Christ, that we will see those marks and we will remember that our sins put Him there. And it won't be that we will weep about that, folks. It will be that we will celebrate the Lamb. That we will cry, Worthy, worthy, worthy is the Lamb. Amen. We'll be so grateful in that place called heaven. Jesus is pictured in this fifth chapter here is bearing the marks of His death. The Lamb was as it's been slain. I believe this based on what happened after His resurrection. He was resurrected from the dead. Ascended to the Father right before their eyes. But listen, before he ascended, there was a doubter amongst the disciples. We refer to him as Doubting Thomas. And anybody who doubts things a lot of times gets called a Doubting Thomas. We probably all deserve that name in some ways. We doubt God's goodness. We doubt God's love. We doubt whether God can sustain us through the storms of life sometimes. We we, we cast doubt on God's character or not, whether He's good or not, but whether He is all-powerful in our circumstance. He's all-powerful when we sing about Him, but is He all-powerful when things go wrong in our lives? Thomas doubted whether Jesus had resurrected. And in John 20 and verse 27, Jesus appears to him, and He says to Thomas, Reach here with your finger." See my hands. And reach here your hand and put it into my side. And do not be unbelieving, but believe me. Folks, the marks that will be on him will leave no doubts about who he is. And there are no doubts in heaven right now in this, this picture we see here of this throne room where the scroll needs to be opened. There are no doubts in heaven about the one that is worthy to take the scroll. All of creation knows that this is the worthy Lamb because even the Bible says in verse 13 there that every creature says what? Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto Him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. The Bible also tells us that he is searching. He's a searching lamb. David Jeremiah points this out that the Bible says that he has seven eyes. The number seven, as we've mentioned before, represents fullness and completion. And so through the power of his Holy Spirit that is pictured here with these seven eyes because that represents the Spirit of God. Listen, these seven eyes, listen, Jesus exercises uh, omniscience and omnipresence. You say, what do you mean by that? He's all-knowing and he's all-seeing, folks. Right. 
He knows everything that's going on. He knows more than Santa Claus. Hello? Yeah. Can I say he sees you when you're sleeping? He knows when you're awake. He knows when you've been bad or good, so be good for goodness sake. Jesus knows. He knows everything that's going on. He sees all. He knows all. And that makes him qualified to make righteous judgment upon the earth. Because he sees where no one else sees. He sees into the heart of man. Oh, I don't know about that, Brother Jeff. Let me tell you something. Even when he walked on on this earth as fully God and fully man, the Pharisees sat there and the scribes in judgment upon the things he was doing, and he perceived their faults. He knew what was in their hearts. Likewise, he knows our thoughts. He knows what's in our hearts. He will execute righteous judgments that are found in this scroll, in this book. And finally, I want to point out to you that he's presenting this, presented in this scripture as having much strength. He's pictured having seven horns. Now, I know I got out of order, but I did that on purpose because I want you to understand something. Horns are always a sign of strength in God's word. He is the Lord God Almighty. He is the one, listen, I, He's the one that is able to execute the judgments that will be found in this scroll. I don't know if you've read ahead. I don't know if you've ever spent time in the book of Revelation. But there are some terrible things that are going to come upon the earth. And then there will be a Savior who won't come as a Savior this time. He'll come as a judge. And he'll make war. We won't read about him in a minute. But he's the one that's able to execute the judgments of this scroll. He has much strength. As a matter of fact, we see the contrast between his first coming and his second coming in something David Jeremiah shares. He says, He is the Lamb at his first coming, He is the Lion at his second. The lamb is meek. The lion is majestic. The lamb is the savior. The lion is sovereign. The lamb was judged. He was judged in your place and my place. The lion is the judge. The lamb brought the grace of God. And the lion brings the government of God. And folks, this is the one that is worthy take the scroll and to open it. And he is coming visibly to this earth. He will come as a lion to judge the earth. Revelation chapter 19. I want you to look at this with me very quickly and we're through. Revelation 19, 11 through 16. He said, I saw heaven open. Now remember, John is where he's at in Revelation 4 and 5, because there was a door opened in heaven. And he was shown these things which were hereafter. In Revelation 19, there's a door that opens in heaven. And listen to what happens. There's something that comes forth from that door that's open. And behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. Now listen to this. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he, listen, he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Jesus Christ. Not coming as Savior, but coming as judge. Coming as king. Lord of lords. 
My question is, as you read that, you might have noticed that there were armies which were in heaven that followed with him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. I want to ask you a serious question tonight. Will you be in the armies of heaven? Will you be with Jesus when he comes? Will you be on the winning side and not be judged by the righteous judge, the Lion of Judah? Or listen, will you be found in rebellion against God as you sit tonight and find yourself under the wrath of an almighty God, his son who's coming to rule and reign, who, listen, when he judges the earth, it's not good, folks. It's not good. He destroys them with that sword. And you say, well, they're gone then. No, physically. They still have to be judged spiritually. And folks, when you stand before God to be judged spiritually, if you find yourself at that great white throne judgment, which we'll see before we get to the end of the book of Revelation, if you make it to that great white throne judgment, there remains no sacrifice. There's nothing that can be done for you. You must do what needs to be done today. Because right now is the day of God. Not tomorrow, not next week. God's ready if you're ready. And you need to call on Him before it's everlasting too late. Will you be with Him when He comes? Will you worship Him now? Or will you stand in horror when the door of heaven is opened and the righteous judge appears? Every head bowed and every eye is closed.